Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Definition, aka the guy who's like a yo-yo because I always bounce back, and for once, because of this episode, I'm not the guy with the worst puns in the world. Anyway, we're here to talk about the latest entry of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and throughout this video we'll be discussing everything you need to know about the show. Obviously, there will be heavy spoilers here, so if you don't want anything ruined, then I highly recommend that you turn off now. Please drop a thumbs up if you enjoy the video, and make sure you subscribe to the channel for breakdowns on the show week by week. With all that out of the way, thank you for clicking this, now let's get into the video. Okay, so the opening of this episode pretty much shows what happened alongside Mac and Deke's excellent adventure, with us getting the perspective of Yo-Yo and Co on board the Zephyr. Now, we did mistakenly say last time that the Zephyr jumped back to save them, but sorry for being a bit, a bit of an idiot, because the rescue mission was actually just them arriving in 1983, and they weren't purposely jumping back. So my bad, I'll understand if you watch some other basement dwellers breakdown of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. from now. Anyway, if you're still here, thanks for sticking around, and this episode sort of centres around Yo-Yo and her inhuman powers. She wants them back, and hooks up with some familiar inhuman faces in order to do this. That's pretty much the overall plot of the episode, but there's actually a lot of notable things to take from the introduction itself. Now, firstly, because of all the quantum entanglements that the time drive has gone through, it's now in a worse state than Jada and Will's relationship. The ship does back-to-back -back jumps early on, and we actually learn a lot more about what Fitz is doing behind the scenes. He's choosing specific locations to put the group at, but due to this not happening with the Zephyr, we know that he's not the one controlling its movements. Now, we don't get to see Fitz return, and I actually have a feeling that he might not even turn up next week. We'll talk about all this when we discuss the promo for episode 9, but I think they're saving him for a big reveal down the line. We know that he and Gemma spent a lot of time working on things before the start of the season, and I actually think that he's going the long way round and has been manually monitoring the Chronicom jumps, waiting till they arrive somewhere before bringing the Zephyr through. I think next time we see him, he'll be an old, old man, and it's gonna come as a big twist. We get a clue about this because Gemma says she's not sure if he'll even get the message that she leaves for him, and with it being in the 80s, and him likely going beyond that, I think that the time difference will just be too much. Now, I've either gotten this theory right, or as per usual gotten it wrong, so as always, leave your thoughts below, as I'd love to hear if you have any of your own theories. Now, Gemma was able to work out what was happening with the jumps due to her understanding of mathematics, and like a stone skimming across the surface of water, the leaps were getting shorter and shorter. This is why she told Yo-Yo and May at the end of the last episode that they had a specific amount of days to get Mac and Deke back, and she's clearly worked everything out. Now, in order to stop these jumps from happening, they need to get the time drive and stabilise it, but there's a rotating field around it that's disintegrating all that come close to it, and thus, they need Yo-Yo to get her powers back to control it. Also, anyone anyone catch Sousa throwing some shade at her, saying, Wait, what can you do? I caught you, Sousa. You, you don't believe in Yo-Yo. Now, Yo-Yo doesn't know what to do, but Sky suggests that they go and visit her mom, aka Jaya Ying, the leader of the afterlife. Afterlife is a sort of sanctuary for Inhumans, and we've been there before in the show, so they head out. I like how they could potentially stop Sky from being born, and though Mac's parents were murdered earlier in the season, at least he was alive, whereas, yeah, at the end of this, you know, it's still all up in the air. They reactivate Coulson before his legs are fully finished, and at least we know he's coming back further down the line as things were kind of all over the place with the whole Max Headroom thing. Now, Yo-Yo says see you in a minute before they head out, and I thought for a second that this meant she was definitely dead because the last time someone said that in the MCU, they didn't come back. Mei and Yo-Yo land outside Afterlife and come across Korra, an associate of Jaya Ying called Lee, and a blind teleporter. This guy doesn't really get that much to do, but the little moments that he has are really enjoyed, and I think the flashes of him moving reminded me a lot of how Nightcrawler teleports too, so it's good that they kept this consistency from the comics. He even makes a sort of bamf sound, so yeah, nice little easter egg there. Now, it's from here that we're reintroduced to Jaya Ying, and if you don't know who she is, then here's a quick catch-up. So, Jaya Ying can absorb life, and thus she's been able to remain forever young. Due to her immortality and living a long life, she gained a wealth of wisdom and found in humans all over the globe, which she slowly started to lead. During this time, she bumped into Calvin Johnson, aka Sky's father, 
and they had a happy life until she was captured by Hydra and experimented on, much like how Sky was with Malik. After they were done with her, they killed her and chopped her up into tiny pieces, but Calvin was able to reassemble her and thus she came back to life. Now after being cake tested all over her body, she started to hate humanity and formed the afterlife who were willing to go to war with them. She even started a war with S.H.I.E.L.D., which we get lip service to when May talks about the last time that she saw Quinjet. I was kind of hoping that Sky would come face to face with her and perhaps lead her in a different direction, but unfortunately she doesn't in this episode, though they do kind of leave things open ended. We also see a diviner, which is used to test whether Yo Yo is an inhuman or not. Diviners are containment devices for Terrigen crystals and they were constructed by the Kree. Several were placed on Earth and buried across the planet, and during World War II, one was found by Hydra, who called it the Obelisk and it was then taken by the SSR before popping back up in the show, creating Sky herself and another Inhuman called Rain. Jia Ying wants to know if Inhuman powers can be removed in some way, and thus she starts therapy on Yo-Yo. She discovers that the problem is psychosomatic, and even proposes a mind meld with Mei. They try some lovely exercises and almost spoon, but when nothing happens, they realise the only way to get into it is to spar with one another. I guess you really don't know someone until you fight them. It's from here that we get flashes of Yo-Yo's memories, including the death of Tess, Ruby, and her traumatic childhood. On board the Zephyr, they try and fix the time drive, but it bombs harder than this channel, and time itself becomes short as the countdown to it closing in on itself draws closer. Sky sits about and looks like crap, and they suggest that she goes to the healing chamber, which looks like it's going to be something big in episode 9. Sousa starts putting parachutes in place in case they need to jump out, and he drops a line about being a paratrooper in World War II, which is something that he's mentioned before. Gemma presents him with a new leg so he doesn't have to limp anymore, and I don't know why she's had this lying around the whole time yet. And you know what, yeah, Sousa, he's slowly becoming one of my favourite members of the cast. Now back with Yo-Yo, we learn of her troubled childhood, and discover that, after her father got in deep with the wrong crowd, she went to live with her uncle and cousin. One of the gangsters tracked him down and demanded the payment that her father owed. The thug noticed a gold crucifix necklace which belonged to her grandma and she managed to steal it back without him noticing. However, the gangster realised it was gone which led to him and her uncle fighting over a gun and her uncle died during the scuffle. Yo-Yo believes that she should have never taken this and thus she now freezes when it's time to act. It's here that we learn more about Korra and we discover that she has highly combustible powers. We learn that Korra is Jaya Ying's daughter, and therefore Daisy's stepsister, which is going to add an interesting dynamic going forward. Afterlife have been trying to remove her abilities due to the pain that it causes, and thus the reason they helped Yo-Yo was to try and discover how to do this. Korra flees to off herself, which is when Malik arrives and destroys her gun. Now, as we know, he's been trying to collect inhuman powers and has been working with the Chronicoms to help to rebuild them. I love how the Maliks have become the big bad of the season, and I'll admit, in hindsight, maybe Daisy should have just killed young Freddy back in the day. Now Malik recruits Korra and his forces storm Afterlife. Korra attacks Lee after Jia Ying tries to calm her down and they flee to the Quinjet and agree to meet once more down the line. They return to the Zephyr and Yo-Yo refocuses her mind, realising that she doesn't have to hold herself back and she removes the time drive, saving the ship. Like I said at the start of the video, I think this was a play on how a yo-yo always bounces back and I thought my puns were bad. I know it's a nickname and that's a line in the show that they've, they've kind of built up to but I just removed it from my memory and yeah, it all, it all came flooding back. Now Sky enters the healing chamber with Sousa at her side and Coulson powers down for a few hours. Though they seem to be out of the woods, the Zephyr actually has another surprise and they jump once more which takes us to episode 9. In the end Stinger, Malik takes over Afterlife to seemingly harvest all of the Inhuman powers. He's pretty much becoming Mr Sinister and I think it's going to be crazy when we see what he's like next time. He's probably going to end up becoming the most powerful Inhuman on Earth and he teases the anarchy that can come from this. Malik was of course missing from the original timeline after he was sacrificed to the god of Hydra and thus we really don't know what's going to happen with him. Anyway that concludes the episode and from this part of the video we're going to be talking about what's going to happen in episode 9 so if you haven't watched the trailer and want to go in as blind as possible then I recommend that you turn off now.
Okay, so we learn that the final jump is going to take them to a time storm in which the day repeats over and over again. As Sky was in the healing chamber and Coulson was powered down, they're aware of it, whereas the other characters don't realise what's going on. It's Groundhog Day for the pair, and Coulson states that he's watched all of them die one by one. I don't know if he actually carries out these murders himself, but it does seem like something more sinister is going on, though he could just be resetting the day in as painful a way as possible. We don't actually see him choking any characters, but yeah, the way they cut it, it does sort of seem like that. Now, I'm kinda in two minds over whether Fitz will appear in this, as it's very difficult to enter and exit a time loop in Marvel, and I think that the people on the inside will have to break the loop themselves by saving all of the characters from their fate or something. However, he could also be the one that pulls them out of it, and he may arrive at the end of the episode to save them from being stuck there, or he, he could be who they come across upon breaking themselves free. We don't know for definite, but either way, it looks like another great episode, and so far, I've really enjoyed the series. I probably felt that this was the weakest entry so far, but even then, it was better than a lot of the last season, so I'm still riding hard for your season 7. Now obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the 8th episode, so make sure you comment below and let me know. If you enjoyed this video, then please drop a thumbs up, and if you missed our analysis of the last episode, then make sure you check it out after this. If you want to support the channel from as little as 99 cents a month, then please click the join button below, as it massively helps us out, and you get access to content early. If you want to come chat to us after the show, either follow us at Heavy Spoilers, or click the Discord link in the description below. Those are the best ways to keep up to date with the channel, and hopefully we'll see you very soon, but if not, have a lovely day, and don't get stuck in any time storms, yeah? Take care of yourself, mate. Cheers. Cheers.